Well, today we have the last sermon in our series based on Adam Hamilton's book, Half-Truths. And the uh, half-truth that we are treating today is one that's uh, probably been heard by everyone at some point or another. And it is, and I'm reading it because when I told Rick yesterday what the topic was, I kept switching it around. It's love the sinner and hate the sin. But I kept saying, love the sin and hate the sinner. <laughs> so, so Chris gave me a paper to help me get it right. But uh, Bill Blackburn told me uh, in between the services that he had fallen asleep until I said it wrong and then he woke up. So this is not helping. <laughs> love the sinner and, and hate the sin. Like the other half-truths that we've talked about in these last several weeks, everything happens for a reason. God helps those who help themselves. Uh, <laughs> come on, John. That God gives us nothing more than we can handle. Yes. And that other great one you did. The Bible says that that... <laughs> Like those others, Jesus never said it, and it isn't even in the Bible. There are parts and pieces of truth in it, profound truth, which is why it has the character of truthiness about it. But when you put it all together in this way, it is not a good guide for Christian living. Love the sinner and hate the sin is fraught with spiritual hazards. But where might the scripture, uh, the expression have come from, rooted in scriptures? Well, first, we are supposed to love others, and all of us are sinners. When Paul talks about sin, he most often uses the Greek word that I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing right, but it's hamartia. And it's uh, most commonly used in the New Testament uh, by Paul and by Jesus. Um, and is translated as sin, but it, it literally means to miss the mark. And thus, it's most fundamentally kind of a, a general description of a distortion from intended purpose. And that distortion of our purpose in our words, in our actions, in our speech, in our feelings, that distortion falling short of the mark that God has laid out for us for what life is meant to be and how we are meant to think about God and one another and treat one another. When we miss that mark, that, that is sin. And I, I don't know, I, I'm fairly confident, although I really am not given to blanket statements, I'm fairly confident that probably in some way describes all of us at one point or another. Um, sin is kind of part of the human condition. It's rooted in our distance, our alienation from God. When Paul writes in Romans 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, I don't have any problem counting myself among that. And he goes on, of course, to say, and are freely justified, justified by God's grace as a gift to the redemption that came in Christ Jesus. So sin is something we can affirm is pretty much out there. We all sin, and we are supposed to love each other. So love the sinner, hate the sin, still some problems. It's interesting that um, I, I can't imagine uh, talking about this phrase without mentioning the time when I most often hear it or when people tell me it's been said to them, it's directed to uh, LGBT people by Christians who do not believe uh, the scriptures are inclusive uh, and accepting. And uh, of course, need to make sure that you know that we believe that the scriptures affirm that love is love, and that sexual orientation is not a sin, and that God means for all persons 
for their love to be fulfilled in loving relationships with others. And it is indeed people who are LGBT that I know of who most often hear this phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin. Did I get it right that time? Okay. I think in some ways, uh, people, other Christians who are perhaps well-intentioned, trying to be understanding, uh, think that by uh, affirming that, they are being generous and gracious. Uh, I think that they would agree that we all are sinners and that perhaps, uh, of course, they are uh, sinners also, and it's, it's nothing wrong with uh, speaking of someone else as a sinner and then qualifying it by hating the sin. I think perhaps it comes out of an illusion of solidarity. And I think uh, when I've challenged people on how, on how false it feels to people who are LGBT, I don't think I've quite adequately been able to convey that. Perhaps you've had the same experience. Now, in my mind, I've wanted sometimes to turn it around so that they might experience and understand, I haven't done it yet, maybe I shouldn't. But I sometimes think, yes, love the bigot, hate the bigotry. (laughs) And then perhaps a person would understand what it feels like to be wrapped up in one pejorative term. It is true that Jesus does love sinners. Jesus says, I came not to save the righteous, but sinners. Those are who are well, who have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. He gave this answer in in response to people who challenged him because he was eating with tax collectors and sinners. They asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? The problem was, why does he go to them? Why does he seek them out? Why does he get close to them? Obviously, in their view, what was implied was that Jesus should put distance between himself and sinners. But Jesus refuses and draws close. Now, I want to just think for a minute about uh, the episodes in the life of Jesus where we see a little bit of a different uh, picture. We see wonderful instances of Jesus drawing close to sinners and offering them forgiveness, grace, healing, new up, new life, like the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Jesus comes in between her and the accusers in a sense to say, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. But in Matthew 23, you might have remembered this passage because it jumps out to you if, you if you think of Jesus as all nice and sweet all the time. In Matthew 23, the whole chapter, he lays in to the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus was harsh in confronting them. Jesus loves sinners, but part of the work of saving people from sin involves confronting them, and particularly, Jesus pulls that out when he's dealing with people who have wrapped themselves in a self-deceiving garb of religious superiority and piety. It's like Jesus is thinking they are not going to be able to look in the mirror and see their true condition because they've covered it up so well with religious garb. And and so I have to do something dramatic to unwrap that. Uh, One writer has has said that uh, Jesus' uh, treatment of the Pharisees in Matthew 23 can be seen as a a, a desperate love-motivated attempt to shock them into realizing their dire situation not unlike a parent who screams to get their child's attention to keep them from danger. Jesus does love sinners. 
But Jesus never only sees sinners. What about uh, the part that uh, hating sin? That also has some rooting in Scripture. Uh, We can think about St. Paul, who writes in Romans 7 about the intense struggle that's going on inside of him. And in some, in some parts of it, he's uh, so strongly wrestling with temptation that he says, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. I hate this part of me, wretched man that I am. Paul is speaking about hating the sin that is inside of himself as he struggles within himself against temptation. And there can be something real, true, and life-giving about that in a way. I remember the time when I was uh, really a a fairly frustrated parent with uh, trying to get my children to be uh, enthusiastic about going to church as I am enthusiastic about being here. And um, just thinking, what is wrong with them? Why can't they see what a great place this is? And I was wrestling this for, with this for a long time, on and off. And then suddenly one day it just occurred to me, you're the problem. You are not as thrilled about them being there where you have to get them on their places and you're trying to work. You are not as thrilled and welcoming to them in that place as you are to the other people there. That was harsh it was a relief. It was a relief to see my sin because I could do something about it. I could change. So when someone is labeling their own sin, something to be hated, it can be good. In Romans 12, Paul says, let love be genuine and hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. But In that context, Paul's talking about hating what is evil. It's an affirmation that we are to make moral distinctions between actions and motivations that are evil and those which are good. We are to make distinctions and judgments about actions. But it stops short, and he stops short of counseling us to hate another person's evil and goes on to say, love one another genuinely with mutual affection. The real problem with love the sinner and hate the sin is that it sets us up for false relationships that are spiritually hazardous to ourselves and to others. The simple fact that we identify someone else in terms of the sinner mischaracterizes them. It's a global label. My mother taught me When somebody has done something wrong to you, you criticize the behavior. You don't globalize it to the whole person. Someone treated you with meanness. They're not a mean person. In the same way, I don't try to globalize people who sometimes poetically are called the poor. The poor are are people who are much more than a lack of resources, have strengths and and potential and talents and gifts. Calling other people the sinner or thinking of others in that category implicitly defines the relationship in terms of judgment of them. And we do it to create distance between us. Notice again the criticism of Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners Don't you know you're supposed to keep your distance from them, the sinners? Notice in the story that we heard Jesus' parable of the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee, the religious man, stands confidently and prays, God, I'm so thankful that I'm not like the sinners and that I do all these great things for you. And the the publican takes himself far off, acknowledges his sin, and Jesus says, that's the one I'm welcoming in. His humility will be exalted. It's really hard to love somebody truly when we think of them by a label. A label 
erases their individuality, the complicated mix that we all are of good and bad struggles and temptations and trials, unrealized potential, and things that we do right and well. It's really hard, if not impossible, for the person who's been held at arm's length by a label to experience anything like love. At best, it will feel like tolerance, and tolerance is almost as different from love as hate is. This is perhaps why when Jesus commands us to love other people, he does so in ways that emphasize relationship. Jesus never says, love the sinner. Jesus says, love one another. Love your neighbor. And did he just mean our neighbor, the one next door? Thank goodness we live almost on a corner and there aren't that many neighbors. <laughs> when someone asked him this question, who is my neighbor? He gives the wonderful story of the Good Samaritan, leaving open that the neighbor is whoever we encounter. The neighbor is the one who cares. The one, neighbor is the one who calls out for us to be in relationship of giving care. The, the neighbor is anyone, but spoken of in a way that emphasizes our side-by-side -side common relationship in this hazardous, exhilarating game called life. At the same time as the sentiment, love the sinner, hate the sin, is spiritually hazardous uh, to those who hold it, it's also not terribly helpful to the person whose sin has been identified. In the Sermon on the Mount, that I love this vivid illustration of the teaching about being concerned with the speck in your brother's eye and missing the plank or the log in your own eye. Have you ever, I have big eyes, so I've actually had a lot of things get in my eyes. Have you ever had somebody else try to get a speck out of your eye? Let me tell you, it is almost impossible for anyone else's finger to come anywhere near your eye without you immediately cramping it up as fast as like it's like so instinctual. It is, you have to have somebody hold your eye open for anyone else to get their finger close by. And it's Jesus' way of saying, you know what? You cannot fix somebody else's sin. It's not your job, and you can't do it. It just doesn't work. And at the same time, it's very hazardous for your spiritual health. Because putting yourself in that place of the sin fixer in other people opens you up to a far graver sin. In Roman Catholic teaching, uh, pride is, is the most potentially grave sin that we can open ourselves up to. It creates the biggest distance between us and God. It's a plank. So by focusing on someone else's stuff and not our own, we set ourselves up for a prideful and false relationship with God. But what do the scriptures say? Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. Jesus was never condemning sin in order to cut himself off from someone else. Jesus never uses a label to take the place of a relationship to make love generic or fake in word only. Jesus died for all kinds of sinners, not to distance himself from them, but to utterly bring them into a kingdom of grace and righteousness with himself. Love the sin and hate the sinner is not Jesus' language. Jesus is love people and give me your sin. My mother's just been the best teacher ever. And uh, 
I think the problem with love the sin and hate the sinner is, I don't know how you'd punctuate it, I'm not very good at punctuation, but I think you'd either put a comma in between those two phrases, or you would put a semicolon. That, no, a colon? Oh, the colon. See, I told you. But I think the reason that we, uh, what's implied there and in, in between those two, really more than punctuation, is there's a, an unspoken but implicit but. I love you, but hate the sinner. Love the sin, but hate the sinner. <laughs> yeah. What? Did I do it? At... <laughs> Blame Bill Blackburn. <laughs> My mom said it the right way. Uh, but she used to say, whenever we'd start to say, I love him, but, or I love you, but, she would, oh, 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 oh. stop right there. There are no buts in love. There are no buts in love. I love you, but, a love with buts is no love at all. Love the sin? No. Love people. Did I do it again? I actually have it written down wrong. I actually wrote it down wrong. Oh my goodness. There's, I hope there are no psychiatrists here today. A love with butts is no love at all. Just remember that part. Amen.